Hello and welcome to my talk, Mind is Software, porting super hot from the screen to the table. It's about the design process that led to super hot the card game. Did you know there was one? First, an introduction. My name is Manuel Correa. English is not my main language, but I'll try to be clear. This is the old game dev PT forum. It was the Portuguese forum for the game's development community. Back in 2004, I used to be known there as Grey Fox. I was so active there that when I went to get a screenshot from the internet archive, I picked a random date, and one of my posts was on the front page in the most recent messages. There. This guy. I got into the games industry in 2010. In the 11 years since then, I've worked as a game designer on several studios. At the moment, I am at Romero Games in Ireland, working on Empire of Sin. It is a strategy game where you are a mob boss in 1920s Chicago during the Prohibition. It uses a blend of real-time strategy and turn-based combat. These are some of the favorite games I've worked on so far. They cover a range of platforms from computers, mobile, augmented reality, virtual reality, and even board games. And I'm here to talk about one of them, Super Hot the Card Game. Since this is a video, I can't ask how many of you have heard of it, so I'll just assume you did not. Let me show you what it is. Superhot is a first-person shooter where time only moves when you move. The game is in super slow motion until you do something like run or look around, so you have time to plan your next steps. The bullets take some time to reach the enemies, so you have to aim where they're going to be. If you get hit, you die and restart. If you kill all the enemies in the level, you win. It turns a shooter into a puzzle, and I think it's great. It makes you feel like you have a superpower. I was a fan since their very first prototype for 7 Day FPS Jam. When they launched a Kickstarter, I was one of their backers. The game was a blast, and I had no idea I would have a chance to put my own spin on it later. Now, to understand the card game, you will also need to know what a deck building game is. Do you know those games like Magic the Gathering where you build a deck and then you play against other people? This is not that. In deck building games you build decks during the game. You start with a small deck with weak cards which you draw from. During the game there will be opportunities to acquire better cards, let's say from a market. You use the cards in your hand to pay for them. Both the cards you used and the cards you spent go to your discard. In about two turns your deck will run out, so you take the discard, shuffle it, and continue drawing from there. Soon you're going to be drawing and using much better cards. This creates a very satisfying loop where you feel like you're building an engine and you get to see it work better and better as the game progresses. Deck building was created by a designer called Donald X. Vaccarino in a game called Dominion. It created a whole new genre of games and for a while they were everywhere in board games. It's still popular nowadays, but it's mostly common in combination with other mechanisms. Took a while for it to catch on with video games, but now it's here to stay. The most well-known at the moment is Slay the Spire. Now I can finally talk about Super Hot the Card Game. Nope, not this. Not that either. There we go. You see, Super Hot the Card Game didn't start from a blank canvas. It actually started with another game called Agent Decker. It's a game for one player that uses deck building to tell a story. You are Agent Decker, a secret agent on your first mission. As you move through the enemy complex, you will improve your skills and collect better gear so you can complete the main objective and get out of there before anyone notices you were there. The alarm raises every turn, so you must choose who you take out. Do you go for the cool weapon or take out the security camera? Instead of a market, we have a line of obstacles which scrolls to the right like a conveyor belt. At the end of the turn, the last one is removed and raises the alarm. One important aspect is that each card has two halves. The bottom is what you are facing, and the top is what you can get from it, what it does when it's in your hand. So, if you disarm the card, you get their gun. It was made for the 2015 Solitaire Print and Play Contest on Board Game Geek. It got second place. It's available as a free PDF that you can download and assemble yourself.
Agent Decker is what I signed with the publisher, Board and Dice. They liked the way it played, but not the setting. And for a while, they were suggesting different ones where the player would be more of a thief, like Aladdin. Irek, one of the publishers, had played Dishonor recently and wanted to make something in that style. Then they asked me, do you know Superhot? Turns out both the publisher and the studio live in the same city, and they already knew each other. Small world. So I answered, I love it, but we can't just reskin it. There are parts that don't match. You see, as a fan, I thought a simple reskin would be unacceptable. Some systems just didn't make sense within the Superhot lore and gameplay. They asked me to think about it and send a paragraph explaining how that would work. The video game is structured in levels, so I started there. I designed a rough level, tried to plan out how I would change the cards to move and shoot, started thinking about the enemies and bullets, and it quickly became too complex and fiddly for the player to manage. It's the sort of thing that works perfectly as a video game, because the computer takes care of it in the background. But in a board game, do you really want a turn phase where you have to advance each flying bullet in a different direction? I don't. Time to try something else. I went a step back and condensed it into a line. In this one, there could be a small player board with spaces, and each could have a characteristic from the scenery, like a wall or a pillar. As the line scrolled, the enemies would hide behind things. Each level would be a different board though, which could become very expensive to produce. So I tried two lines of cards. One was obstacles and items, and the other was scenery. There were a few problems with that approach. Two lines of cards took a lot of space on the table, and they were uncomfortable to manage. While scrolling the cards, it was easy for some to bump into others, which could make them rotate in place. It didn't feel like it was worth pursuing. I tried combining the two lines into one. Cards had a main color and another one on their edge. If they ended up next to another with the same colored edge, the bottom of the card activates. This could simulate enemies hiding and using items. This one felt solid enough to make a prototype, so I kept developing it. That's the setup and play area, and that's the prototype. You can see the matching colors on the edges. I had to make sure the game would work, so in the end, instead of a paragraph, I sent them a playable prototype. That way the game could speak for itself. They were impressed, and the project was approved. As I kept playtesting, I could see that keeping track of all the combinations and changes to the cards was getting too much for players. I went back to the drawing board. What's the essence of Superhot? In my point of view, there are enemies, bullets are flying, and time is stopped. Time only moves when you move. So I'll focus on that. Instead of designing levels, they will be created by shuffling the deck, which has obstacles, items, and enemies. What you see in the line is what the character sees, and scrolling the line represents you moving through the level. But even though the super hot card game was supposed to be based on Agent Decker, there were some systems that did not fit at all and had to be replaced. One was the alarm. At the end of the turn, the last obstacle card in the line is discarded, and raises the alarm. If it reaches 50, you lose. Superhot doesn't have anything like this, so I'll have to find a new way to lose. But we'll get to that. There are the missions. There's a sequence of five missions, each with a different goal. They make a very slim story. Every time you complete one, new cards are added to the deck, raising the difficulty and adding new elements to interact with. This also limits replayability, because once you know all the goals, it's easier to prepare. Even though Super Hot, the video game, has a story, it isn't a big part of the game. And I couldn't just add piles of new cards since that would be expensive to produce, so I'll have to work with what I have. Powering up. In Agent Decker, you find new objects and improve your skills. At the end of the game, you are much better than you were at the beginning. In Super Hot, there isn't anything like that. Well, just one, but I'm not going to spoil what it is. At this point, I'd like to tell you what working with the Superhot team was like, but that didn't really happen. 
since the publisher was so close to them, they always met face to face and told me how it went later. I think this example resumes the whole story well. Early on, I asked if they had a list of things in the game to make cards from. You know, enemies, weapons, assets, and environments. I was especially interested in finding out what they call the enemies in the game since they are never addressed directly. I didn't have a direct contact with them, so I told Board and Dice to ask them the next time they met. No answer. I don't know where the communication broke down there, but I still had to name all those cards. So I thought, I'll name them something silly, and then when they see the prototype, they'll ask me to correct it. So I took an enemy card, and I named it Dude with Gun. This time, there was a reaction. They thought it was funny, so it ended up in the game. I still don't know what they're called. So I ended up having to play through the game again, and I wrote down everything I saw. My communication with them was very limited, and by far the most relevant one was this request. When you kill an enemy, you get their gun immediately, instead of the gun going to your discard so you could draw it later like other deck building games do. This sounds like a small change, but it affected the game in a serious way. It was the start of the bullet time mechanics. So from this, I ended up with this. Don't worry, I won't do a full rules explanation, I'm just showing you this so you can see how similar the setup is to Agent Decker. Now I can tell you how I brought the most important mechanics over to the card game. The first and most important one is, time only moves when you move. In a card game, how do you simulate that effect of time stopping and then speeding up at the player's control? One thing I heard a lot was, well that's just how board games work, that's the game is stopped until you take a turn. Yeah, sure. But what I was looking for was that sense of acceleration. Small steps in preparation, and then a big turn where you get to do a lot. Bullets coming towards you, then stopping time so you can think of what to do next. When I was studying the game, I had a realization. If you look at it closely, Super Hot is turn-based already. Hear me out. The super slow motion gives you time to look around and plan your next move. The choice of when to speed it up is in your hands. At the center of the table there is a line of six cards. They represent where you are, what you see, and which enemies are there. Using the cards in your hand, you can destroy or knock them out, which will change the line. In the following example, you have used two cards from your hand. This means the last two cards in the line will be discarded at the end of the turn. The remaining cards will scroll to the right, and the line will refill back to six cards. So it's up to you. Use one card and the line barely moves or use your whole hand, and it can change radically. Time only moves when you move. This change worked in both a mechanic and thematic sense, but without the alarm we needed a new source of tension. Something to make the players think twice about scrolling the line at maximum speed, sprinting past everything in the level. Maybe something sprinting in the other way. In your direction. What we need are bullets. Bullets are the glue that holds the game together. They are an ever-present threat in the original video game. Pick any random moment in the game, and the odds are you are reacting to a swarm of bullets flying in your direction. If a single one hits, it's game over and you have to replay the level. What can you do? The most intuitive solution is to dodge, but you must be careful. Time advances with every step you take, and dodging a bullet can mean three other ones just got closer. Time goes hand in hand with bullets. So, how do they work in the card game? At the end of the turn, the enemies in the line will shoot. These bullets will go to the objective's discard pile. That's right, the bullets don't go straight into the line. Just like the original video game, you have some time to deal with bullets from distant enemies before they come back to haunt you. When the obstacles deck runs out, you shuffle their discard pile to form the new one, and from this point onwards, bullets will sneak into the line. When the line scrolls, the cards that get discarded go to your hand representing your movement through the level, picking things up. If one of those cards is a bullet, it will stay in your hand. This is a big problem because it has no use, takes up space, and blocks you from drawing new cards at the end of the turn. If you get hit by four, it's game over. Four? But in the video game, one bullet is enough to take you out. What happened? You knew this was coming. There were some things that had to be changed in order to work in the card game, but don't worry, I'll tell you why. This is where I had to bend the rules. In the video game you can just push a button and the level instantly resets. In a second you are back in the action. 
In the card game, you would have to separate the cards and go through the setup again. It could take a few minutes every time. That's too much. I know because I played it like that and it wasn't good. It's punishing and it makes the players dwell on their mistakes rather than give them the will to try again. Making the bullets a growing hindrance instead of the end game also let me bring a key aspect from the video game. But I cannot mention it without spoiling the video game, so let's move on. Agent Decker's campaign is designed around a sequence of five missions. The good part is they give the players new objectives along the way, forcing them to adapt as they're gradually pushed outside of their comfort zone. The bad part is that this only works once. Once you know the missions and how to beat them, the mystery is gone and you can prepare for them in advance. Being a print and play game, the players would have to assemble it before playing, so I wanted to keep the card count fairly low. Instead of adding more goals, I added a high score system. The first goal is to beat the campaign, and the second, if the player wants to, would be to beat their previous high score. This lack of replayability was one of the first things I wanted to address in Super Hot the Card Game. In the original video game, the main objective is to kill every enemy in the level. That's where my design started, but I quickly ran into three problems. First is it's easy to lose track of how many enemies are left in the deck, and I didn't want the players to stop playing so they could flip the deck over and count. Second, being a deck building game, there was the risk of a player simply adding all the enemy cards to their deck from the previous level, preventing them from being able to complete the next one. Third, having a single objective got very repetitive, even if the enemy total would increase throughout. It nudged the players towards building one specific type of deck, ignoring everything else you could do in the game. To fix this, I needed to steer away a bit from the original game. I added different goals, aiming at exploring the game's mechanics and obstacles while keeping within the focus of the game. This one makes the player watch out for cards in the line so they can take them out. This one makes them prepare and do a big move that takes out all the cards in the line. This one is a bit more complex. First the player needs to make sure the enemies shoot, then they need to strategically take out cards in the line to make sure that there are two bullets out there at the same time so they can take them out. And of course the card game also has a katana so you can cut flying bullets. There are a lot more goals which can be shuffled to give players a different experience every time and keep them on their toes. The cards become a series of dots which the goals ask you to connect into different shapes by doing the things you do in the video game. Of course, with randomized goals I had to rethink their difficulty. Agent Decker's fixed sequence let me control the pace at which the difficulty increased. This system does not. The goals have to work whether they show up at the start of the game or further along when the challenge is meant to have ramped up. In the end the solution was simple. To complete the game the player has to beat a series of levels and each level has a different number of goals. The goals for each level are active at the same time so the player can plan for them and sometimes coordinate their moves to complete them quickly because the more time they spend on a level the higher the chance of being shot. Also, the bullets stay in the deck between levels. Oh yeah. Everything I told you so far has been about the solo game. That was the plan for a good part of the process, but as the publisher started preparing for the Kickstarter campaign, they wanted the biggest audience they could get, which meant expanding the game's player count. To make things a bit more challenging, we couldn't add too many cards, since that would increase manufacturing costs. Plus, all these modes were new to the game. The video game is single player, and in all the versions they've released so far, that hasn't changed. The first new mode was two-player co-op, so there are two players and they are trying to complete the goals together. Philip, one of the publishers, was a fan of the Lord of the Rings deck building game where players can pass cards to each other. I looked into it, tried it out, and it worked seamlessly. It works like this. At the end of the player's turn they can place one card from their hand on the table between them. It cannot be a bullet card. On the next player's turn, they can use it as if it were on their hand, and if they don't use it, they give it back. I thought this would make the game easier, but since the enemies still shoot at the end of each turn, it balances itself out. The player that gave away a card will have a harder time on their next turn because they don't have as many cards, so they need to coordinate well. It did make the game shorter though, so I added one more goal to each level, and a new condition to end the game if they had too many combined bullets in their hands. Otherwise, one player could be used as a human shield. 
all we would need to add in order to make this work would be eight new cards, which is a starting hand for the new player. The publisher also wanted a mode where one player could play against the other. One would be the player and the other... Um, there's nothing like that in the video game. And how many cards can I use? Huh. That left me no choice but to use what we already had, which was the obstacles deck and the line. To keep in line with the meta layers of the game's theme, we created a concept of the system player, which is playing as an antagonistic AI that is trying to stop the player from winning the game. And to do that, they can cause glitches that affect the line. It's not all pain and suffering for the main player, they still have some control. After they play a turn, the system player takes the top 4 cards of the obstacles discard pile and adds up the skill values from the bottom of the cards to pay for activating their abilities. So the cards that the main player uses on their turn will define the resources that the system player will get. It's a challenging push and pull system that I haven't seen in other games. So the one card is used to list the system player's abilities, their costs and what they do. As if that wasn't enough, the publisher also wanted the option for two players to be able to play against one, which was uh, easy actually. You can play the other modes I just described at the same time. Two players are working together and the system player is trying to stop them. You don't even need to add any new cards. In the end, we have enemies shooting, bullets flying towards you, and the control of time is in your hands. Sounds like super hot to me. Plus, the card game gives you the chance to share it with other people, which is the first in the series. The Kickstarter campaign went really well, in part because they were also giving out keys for the video game. The goal was $8,000 and we got $117,000, which is over 1400%. The game came out at UK Games Expo 2017, and for three days I was there teaching the game, screaming the rules over the very loud crowds. The reaction was mostly positive. People who played the original game were impressed that this was able to capture the core of Superhot in another medium, but there were also a couple of things that could have gone better. The rulebook was rushed. It should have been clear. We had players who couldn't learn from it, which was a problem, especially for the super hot fans that weren't familiar with modern board games. So as an aside, good rule books are essential. It could be the best game in the world, but if people cannot learn how to play it, they will never know. Fortunately, there were already some good video overviews on YouTube where they could see how the game worked. The main problem for me was that some players found a way to play where they wouldn't lose. It's counterintuitive and very tedious, but they were able to avoid and react to all the bullets, which was the main thing that made the game's difficulty ramp up throughout. I was counting on players' mistakes adding up, and they weren't making any. I attribute this to a lack of playtesting. Most publishers will provide help by playtesting and developing the game. Board and Dice did not, so I had to test the game by myself and occasionally with others around me, and this situation never came up. I even know how I would have fixed it, which would have been to limit the amount of times the obstacles deck is shuffled. But the game was already out, and it's not easy to patch a physical game. Fortunately, I don't think this affected many players, just the most competitive ones with a tendency to micromanage, but still, I wish it hadn't happened. If you want to try the game and you want to have fun, don't look it up. In the end, I never knew what the super hot team thought about the card game because they never told me. But I think some of my ideas influenced their next release, Super Hot Mind Control Delete. Mostly the modular levels and player upgrades, especially the extra health points. That was a big relief because it validated some points where I had to bend the original rules. If you'd like to play it now, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, the game is out of print, which means it's not being manufactured anymore, but some stores might still have a few copies. I also found three tabletop simulator modules, so that might be a viable alternative. And I know it's not the same thing, but Agent Decker is still available for free. So to sum it up, here are the three main takeaways. 
don't just emulate. Emulating the mechanics one-to-one -one makes the game fiddly and it bloats the rules. The players might think that this is what they want, but if they try to play it, they'll quickly realize it's just a ton of busy work with too many rules to keep in mind. Focus on the decisions to get to the emotions. Focus on the decisions the player makes while playing the video game and try to recreate those. In my experience, this is a great place to start if you're looking to recreate that feeling. And three, there is no right way to do it. This might sound like a contradiction of the other two, but here's why. I am sure that if I had started from a briefing like Adapt Super Hot to a Board Game from scratch, without Agent Decker, it would have ended up as a very different game and it would have been equally valid. So thank you for listening. I hope it was useful for some of you, and if you have a chance to play it, I hope you have fun. Thank you Game Dev Camp for inviting me. Thank you Saramena for your support, patience, and for making the art for Agent Decker. Thank you Board and Dice for giving me a chance, and thank you to the Kickstarter backers for making it possible. If you want to reach out, here are my contacts. I am Games by Manuel pretty much everywhere these days. If you like this talk and would like to hear more about my design process, I post about my projects on my site in the blog section. So have fun and enjoy the rest of the event.